the fastest. It's the one the most immediate concern is anything that's a safety concern. Okay, okay. If they would have said first, yeah, I, and I, and that's one that I got wrong. Yeah. Well, I, I, I see what you're saying, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you. I mean, we could read it word for word. It's like, okay, this has got to be the right answer. No. Right. Like I said, right. the way they put those questions, they can judge it either way. Mm -hmm. so. I, the one that got me for the longest time, and it took me months of going through, looking for it very specifically, is a question that you'll get on this hard floor section. It's about retainer ring. And that's why I stress that in the class. Retainer rings are those clips that are on a high-speed buffer, usually. Um, and so they're associated with a high-speed. The So that should be the answer, I'm, I'm almost certain of. But it's, it's a trick one because I was like, where does it say retainer rings? And I kid you not, there's only one reference in the entire book to retainer rings. It's that little paragraph on the right in side that, of the page. Exactly. And I literally, <laughs> on page 57, I've had to underline it to make sure I I have it very specifically. Because nowhere else in the entire book does it re reference retainer rings. You know, when I saw that, I took that as one of these things where they want to make sure you're reading it. <laughs> so they put this one <laughs> yes. little thing somewhere in there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What the heck is an interlock? What does it look like? An Instalock? Instalock. Okay. I'll show you a picture in your book. Oh, it's in the book. Okay. Yep. The Instalock oh, is my bad driver. I see it. Yeah. Yep. Are yep. you looking at page 61? Yes. So okay. that's a, a floor brush. But basically, yeah. the, the Instalock is that pad driver that I showed you guys that looks similar to a floor brush, but it's going to be smaller bristles. Okay. And I again, it's a term that the manufacturer, somebody has um, come up with that literally, I've been in the business my whole life. Until I went through this book, I had never heard of the term Instalock, ever, ever. And I'm like, what the heck is an Instalock? <laughs> and well, what did you, you know, call it? We, what did you call it? What was an Instalock? Pad driver. It's a pad driver. Pad driver. Yeah, and that's what everybody. If you go calling it an Instalock, you will have guys who've been in the business forever look at you going, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> it's a pad driver. And the funny thing is that um, the how do I put it? The, there's other really weird terms in our business. And I'll take a few minutes to show the whole class some of these today. One of which is called a doodle bug. Mm. And old school custodians, janitors know exactly what a doodle bug is. Um, it's basically a little hand pad. It's one of these, okay, a rectangular pad. That goes on to, you actually have a little backer plate and a handle so that you can get baseboards and edges along the wall clean without having to bend over and scrape it or anything like that. So that's a, a doodle bug. Again, that's not a term that's going to be in the book because that's just a you know slang term that we've used in the industry. The other one is called a Johnny Mop. And when we get into dealing with restrooms, I'll show you what a Johnny Mop is. But a Johnny Mop. I know mop, what it is. A bowl swab. It looks like a Q-tip. It's a toilet brush, right? It's a toilet brush, but it's specifically to hold the chemical onto the brush and you yeah. swap the inside of the toilet. Okay, not to get gross. How do you keep that thing clean if you, you're dealing with a lot of soil? Um, the chemical itself, and remember, it's not meant to, to clean with. It's only meant yeah. to apply the chemical with. Okay. So um, from that standpoint, they're about a dollar in cost. So I tell guys, replace them regularly. Those things okay. are going to get funky. Okay. Yeah. And they're made out of a rayon material. So, you know, you can 
rinse them out with hot water. You know, I basically always would keep mine. I would <laughs> get a little gross. I would, after I cleaned the inside of the toilet and the toilet was clean, I would swab it inside, rinse it out. I've, you've got your glove. I'd wring it out. Then I'd turn around and uh, put it into my container so that it was kept separate. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, there's some, we deal with some gross stuff at times. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Uh, we were talking about, you were talking about the doodle bug. With the, yes, sir. Uh, the two, the equipment, I have one. There you go. That's a doodle bug. <laughs> That's the doodle bug holder. And a doodle bug's the combination of that and the pad, the doodle bug pad, which I was just showing them the pad, Nelson. That, yeah. This pad yeah, goes exactly onto that holder. Yeah. <laughs> and the pad, they have. You muted. What'd you say, Nelson? The pad, what? No, uh, they, uh, the pads are different colors. Yeah, they have them in black, brown, green, white. Yeah. What did you use that doodle bug for? For doing things like scrubbing along the baseboard okay. or to get the edge of the floor. Because remember, a swing buffer, we're doing a scrub and we're doing or stripping a floor is a round pad and it's not going to get into the corners. And so a lot of times to get those corners and edges, you would use a doodle bug. Okay, it almost looks like, I don't know if it's the right name, but it almost looks like a trowel where painters used to, or people that lay tile used to do the mud, you know? It's flat. Okay. Yep. Similar concept. Okay. Yep. Right. It's just, you got, got a gripper there to hold it. Okay. All right, let me grab the attendance real quick, and then we'll get started with class today. So today is a, a kind of a fun day of class because we're going to cover material that you guys can put away your books we, this is not anything that would be tested on, but it's more informative for you guys to kind of understand um, a little bit more about the different types of floors we work with. Because remember I showed you about the, uh, the stripping and waxing of floors? Well, this is going to cover things along the lines of polished concrete and wood floors, just so you guys get an understanding of the other types of hard floors. So let me get our attendance real quick, guys. Nice to see you this morning, Christina. Thank you. You're welcome. And guys, I have the video processed. It'll be in uh, the portal, the uh, Google Classroom. Uh, today, I it took a long time to process the other day. So when I came back to it this morning, it was sitting there for me. So, so make sure I've got everybody. What is he doing? Ken, you've been quiet lately. What's that? <laughs> Thank you. It's nice to know you're there. All right. Yeah, Mark's here. All right. We only have one missing today. So. Okay. So fun stuff today dealing with, uh, as I mentioned, wood floors and concrete floors. And as we started out this lesson talking about the fact that there are a variety of different kinds of flooring, you know, in the hard floor section, uh, we break it apart into three basic categories. Resilient, which is going to be those vinyl flooring, such as uh, the LVT, VCT, um, you know, the those are vinyl types of flooring. Linoleum, uh, we think of like the, 
linoleum floors that you would see in people's homes for many years. Um, those are kind of becoming outdated, but we still even see commercial sheet vinyl, which is a type of linoleum material that is just rolled out, glued onto the floor. You'll see it in restrooms. You may see it in medical buildings. Um, they can get pretty decorative with those kinds of flooring. Most of all the resilient flooring, majority of it needs a coating on it to protect that flooring because it is a soft material. What we're going to discuss today is a little bit about some of the stone flooring out there in the business as well as wood flooring. And um, one of the more common stone floors that is gaining a lot of traction is polished concrete. You're seeing polished concrete in office buildings. You're seeing polished concrete in retail. Um, you know, we all think of every hardware store around has got a concrete floor nowadays. Um, they've all ripped up the stuff for since the beginning. Home Depot and Lowe's never even put a material down it. You might think about it, why they do that. If you imagine you're building uh, a structure, it has a cement foundation uh, and slab that that building is put on. So why not use that as the flooring surface? Um, you know, and, and you have a variety of looks to it in the uh, hardware stores. You'll notice it's just clean concrete floor. It doesn't have much of a gloss. But if you go into Costco, I think we all think of when you first walk into Costco, how glossy that floor is. It's got an amazing view to it where, I mean, the especially the section where all the televisions are at, I mean, that floor just shines. And it's interesting because uh, I have friends who've worked at Costco in the maintenance department over there. Uh, one of my good buddies does. And for many, many years, Costco used a process on polished concrete where they put a coating onto the floor. And that's what gave it its gloss. But as they've gone along and they realized that becomes very expensive um, for them to put this coating down on the concrete. And coatings don't last when you have a lot of people walking across the floor. So they've gone to a system that utilizes diamonds. And that's what we're going to explain. The interesting concept about this, when we deal with stone floors, there are two things to consider. First of all, stone floors by their nature are very alkaline. Okay. Um, think about the lime uh, or lye and the different things that are in a, a floor. Um, they because of the high alkalinity, if you put a coating on top of it, it basically starts to strip the coating off from underneath. The other thing about stone floors, they're very porous. They're natural sur substances, whether it's concrete or um, like a stone floor, such as a um, marble floor or ter uh, terrazzo, which is a combination of um, cement and marble chips. You know, these floors have a lot of pits and everything else. And so as a result, to get their gloss, it's achieved not through laying of a coating, but rather through polishing. And, you know, when we think of a polished stone, you can think of the, the gloss that that gets. Even imagine a diamond. If anybody has ever seen a rough cut diamond they don't have much gloss. To achieve the gloss, they have to polish the surface smooth. And so they'll grind it to get that nice smooth surface. So in the video we'll show you, I'll explain the process they're going through. I'm going to mute out any of the audio and I'm gonna basically narrate some of the video so I can go through the steps with you. But basically the concept with polishing of stone is to use progressively a different grit of diamond. The first step is really to cut the diamond or cut the um, stone with a, a diamond tooling, okay? Now, most of the time these are, it's a synthetic diamond that's embedded into either metal 
or a epoxy resin that holds it into what we refer to as a puck. And that helps us to cut the floor surface smooth. And that's what gives us that initial cut and will expose aggregate if we're dealing with concrete or terrazzo. Um, and, and an example of where this is being used, by the way, Elk Grove School District made a decision and it's probably been almost six, seven years ago that they began this process in restrooms in the schools where they used to have sheet vinyl that as they have replaced this vinyl and, and removed it out of the schools, they replaced it by then removing it, removing all the glue and mastic off the floor, grinding the floor smooth, and then polishing that to achieve its gloss. Now, one of the things about polished concrete is that concrete is made of a combination of sand, what's called Portland cement, and stone or aggregate, and that holds together. But it's very porous, and so what will end up happening with concrete is when you cut the, the surface, right, and if anybody's ever seen concrete laid, you will trowel the surface smooth to get that nice smooth look to the concrete. When they grind it, they remove that top layer and it exposes the aggregate, the stone in there, but it also creates a problem where that floor is what we call open or porous. So to resolve that, part of the polished concrete process is to add what's called a chemical densifier to make the concrete hard again and to replace what was taken off on that cream top of the floor. And so it's not so porous and won't stain so badly. So polished concrete is a process of grinding, chemically densifying the floor, and then polishing it to a high gloss. And the gloss range is incredible. You can get to a point of it is so smooth that it will look like glass on the surface. The interesting thing about a polished concrete floor is it doesn't make it, the smoother it is, doesn't make it necessarily slippery, okay? Um, it still has good traction underfoot. So from that standpoint, it doesn't create a safety hazard by making it smooth. And this industry at this point is just about 20 years old. It, it started very gradually and it began through the decorative concrete industry where people started to go into like coffee shops and retail uh, locations. And they started doing, playing around with the ideas of what would happen if I just took that concrete floor and put a, a stain on the floor or decorated it and painted the floor. So then they started doing things, working with diamonds and an industry developed. So that's what we'll, we'll go through is a little bit about how that's done. And then the important part for us is how do we maintain it? And then we'll go through the same thing with gym floors. How is the gym floor uh, restored? You know, what is the process? And then how do we maintain that? So this should be fun. I, you know, to me, I, I enjoy this. And this is also where for you guys, I mentioned the idea of different career paths. These are things that are, when you get into the restoration work, you can garner a whole lot more money learning how to do these different things of polishing concrete and so forth. Some of the, within Elk Grove School District who does a lot of polished concrete, they have a crew that is a specialty crew. They literally do things like during the summertime, they're the same crew that does the gym floor restoration. They do the polished concrete work during the school year. And they're also the crew that does the deep cleaning of carpets with a truck mounted carpet cleaning machine. So that crew who is their specialty crew within the district, they have a nighttime supervisor and his job is to manage all these projects that they do. And it's all the project work that goes on. So it's a really neat 
uh, opportunity for them. Obviously, an opportunity to make a little bit more money. I don't know how the pay structure works in a school district for that specific position, but it, it's a little bit more challenging than doing, uh, you know, the standard janitorial. So, um, but you're going to have to get very familiar and comfortable with equipment. If anybody ever down the road is interested in this stuff, uh, my goal is that by the end of the year, we launch a, a couple specialty workshops to teach polished concrete um, and to teach gym floor restoration. So I'm going to be looking to uh, have some specialty classes that I'll be offering to people on that. All right. So this information is contained, these videos I posted into our Google Classroom. So I'm going to go in there. And then as I... As a reminder, we will do our breakout rooms today as well. So, And I'm not sharing audio on this one because I want to kind of narrate this for you guys. So with what we have here is a clean concrete slab. And the machine that you see here is a concrete grinding machine. And what they're doing is cutting the floor. Um, the machine itself has is hooked up to a vacuum system. There are two different processes of doing this. You can do it with dry grinding or now a process of wet grinding. Um, there's a, a, other videos that will show the wet grinding process. Um, it doesn't matter whether you drew dry or wet. I will say this, though. Um, the process of doing this this material that is being cut has to be sucked up with a specialty vacuum cleaner because the material that is being exposed, that dust, is a known carcinogen, okay? It is silica dust. And silica, if you think about it, um, you know, years ago we talked about asbestos as being something that would attach to the lungs and it would damage and destroy our lungs and people would die from it. Um, silica dust, not quite as bad, but it's still very bad to breathe. So typically, if you're doing a dry process, which this video was created, I think, a little bit before some of the federal laws went into place, you are now required to wear a respirator and have a vacuum system. Now, he is using a vacuum system with this. So he's grinding the floor. Again, this is sped up for purposes. He's using a diamond that is a 30 grit diamond. So very aggressive. Here he's going to do the hand polishing around or hand grinding around the drain. Again, even though it's got a vacuum system, he should be wearing a um, tool. He's picking up some of the excessive moisture or dust. Again, nowadays these have a uh, process of doing it. Now, You'll notice he just splashed on some material on the floor. That is the densifier. That's what makes the concrete hard. And what happens with this is this silicate material reacts to the free calcium inside the concrete that is sitting there and expands and it literally creates a brand new polymer that fills in the voids, the open spaces in the concrete to make it harder or more dense, therefore the term densifier. And you're just applying it throughout the floor. Now, I'll pause for a second. I want to explain something. They apply it very heavy, and we call it applying it to, to rejection. Basically, you want to put on as much as the concrete will soak up and allow it to sit there usually for a period of uh, 15 to 20 minutes, sometimes even longer, and then they will remove the excess. So 
So you're just spreading it throughout. It's now dried and cured onto the concrete. He's moving on to the next step of the polishing. He went up to an 80 grit metal diamond. So he's changing the diamonds on his uh, tool here. And he would have changed also the diamonds on the big grinding machine. So again, now he's uh, doing it a next level. Once you've cut the concrete with the first aggressive grit, and this is a perfect picture, then you would go to that polishing step. If you'll notice, each of these little knobs, okay, is a piece of hard metal embedded with diamonds. And the grit is the amount of diamonds that are within that square inch, okay? So just like sandpaper has a coarse grit, it's how much grit is contained in the, the sandpaper. Same concept here. Now we have synthetic diamonds that are used for cutting. And the reason we use diamonds, even synthetic diamonds, is because they're the hardest known substance on the earth, right? Therefore, a diamond is going to do a great job of polishing or grinding um, any stone. So generally speaking, anytime you're polishing or grinding of stone, you use diamonds. Same process is used for marble, for polishing it, because it's using a diamond system. Granite is using diamonds to do it. Um, terrazzo, uh, you know, all stone floors that um, are created, they'll use a diamond process unless it's something like a tile, like a, uh, a porcelain or ceramic tile. Uh, obviously, they don't grind or polish those. Those are made in the factory. All right, so he, he's using these diamonds on the machine. Now, a much slower process. He's already cut it. Now he's doing a polishing step, and it looks not much different. Again, a lot of that is dust on the floor. He's going to pick that up. And you'll notice it will progressively go up in grits. Now he has a diamond that is, instead of that very aggressive one, it's more, there's more diamonds in it and it begins to polish more. Now he's gone up to a hundred grit. And you'll notice it's gone to a wet process, okay? And it's creating what's called a slurry there. And he's just progressively going up in diamonds to a, a 200 grit, slowly polishing it, the floor. So the process of creating a concrete, a polished concrete floor is in many ways slow and methodical. It doesn't require much chemicals. It's mainly water, but it does require a lot of time to do it. It's very labor intensive to create a polished concrete floor. But the great part is once it's done, it's very easy to maintain. Again, taking it up to now and even more diamonds, 800 grit, and you start to see the gloss become evident here. Now he's gone up to an 1800 grit. This is going to give a very wet look to the floor, a very smooth floor. See how the lights are starting to reflect in the floor? He's hand polishing this area. He's going to go up to a 3000 grit, which is extremely smooth floor. Each process removes the scratches that were created from the diamond before until you get to the point where you have so many intense, fine scratches that the floor is perfectly smooth. Now he's buffing the floor out. 
a lot of times they've gone to using a propane power buffer for this final step. But look at the difference. Look at what happens with this floor. Now look at how smooth and polished that is. It's an amazing process that occurs in doing that kind of flooring. But the result is absolutely amazing. Mark, you're asking about the type of pad. Why don't you uh, ask the group a little bit more? Yeah, so um, I noticed that you said the little diamond cut uh, uh, attachments and whatnot, but yep. he's got the big machine. Is that little piece on the big machine with the buffer it pad is. around it? Yep. Okay. So what lost happens, me there as far as wondering. Yep. What happens on that big machine is they have multiple heads, and those diamonds will be put onto a head, and usually it's three to four heads that are spinning each, and then the whole thing is spinning around. We call that like a triple planetary, meaning it's spinning here plus the head is spinning. And so they might have three on this one and three on this one. And as they're spinning, it's what's creating the cutting action. Now, the initial strip when they first started, was that a single big pad on there? Nope. Again, or was the that the same thing, concept? Same concept, the same small concept. little pucks. And we refer to them as right. pucks. And each of those are hooked onto that machine. They have different ways that are attached. Some will use um, metal where it's magnetic to hold on to it. Others will use Velcro. I'm not a big fan of the Velcro because as they get wet, they'll fall off. Um, and then the others will even go to clicking into it where it literally snaps in. Um, I like the magnetic. They just hold real well. And it's simple. So, but it's up to the manufacturer who makes the machine. Um, and this has become such a huge industry that at one of the largest trade shows that Las Vegas has every year, it's called the World of Concrete. At that show, the polished concrete section takes up an, ex an entire exhibit hall. Now, the World of Concrete actually is so big, it covers everything from, you know, concrete pumper trucks and the grading equipment for doing highways and those things, but they have a, a huge section just to polish concrete and decorative concrete. Nelson, your question. So when they put the, you call it the paw pads? The uh, pucks? Yeah, the pucks. So when they um, put them on the machine, do they lift the machine or do, is there they some do. And Usually, it, it depends on the weight of the machine. Some of these machines require two people to lift because they're so heavy. So here's what's incredible about this. What you saw was a gigantic machine, right? This guy was, it, it's a big machine to run. And they make them so big that they can be run with a remote control. The guy is literally just walking beside it with the remote but they also could go as small as what we refer to like the side by side swing buffer side to side swing buffer they will use those for doing small projects that's what elk grove school district does for doing the restrooms they'll use one of those does an incredible job usually you'll put some a weight kit on it so it adds some extra weight to hold it down but there's a lot of variation from anything from a swing buffer all the way up to a large grinding machine, which is about a $35,000 machine. So that industry has exploded. There's a lot of guys who do it. But as you can imagine, the thing about polished concrete is once the work is done to polish it, then it's just really a case of maintaining that polish. So that's the real value to a facility going to a polished concrete is it doesn't need to be polished all the time. Usually, if it's properly maintained in a good maintenance program, this process will never need to be repeated. Now, one of the things that uh, Costco found is because they were using a coating, that coating would wear off, and periodically they would have to have somebody come in and 
kind of regrind and polish. And that, as you can imagine, it takes a lot of time to do this, especially when you're talking about a building that is, you know, hundreds of thousands of square feet, like a, a big warehouse building. So that being said, more and more of them have gone to a program where they will maintain the floor using a diamond pad. So that being said, I'm going to show you how do we maintain a polished concrete floor. And if you remember what I was telling you about the other in our last class, that the maintenance of these floors is typically the same um, no matter what kind of floor. So hang on a second. Now this one, I'm going to let the narrator share and speak um, because I want to have him explain a little bit about this process. This comes, this video comes from the Polished Concrete Network. This is a trade association for the polished concrete industry. And this guy will kind of explain a little bit about the maintenance of polished concrete. I'm Bob Harris for Concrete Network. Maintenance on your polished concrete floor is an important consideration. Although polished concrete is a lower maintenance floor system compared to some alternative floor coverings, there is no such thing as no maintenance. Polished concrete will require some form of maintenance to preserve the gloss and a non-absorbent surface. Whether your polished concrete is in a commercial or residential environment, it is important to keep particulate off of the floor daily if possible starting with the floor mats both inside and outside the door. It is also a good idea to dust mop the floor on a daily basis, which with this one small step alone can help preserve the floors. In a commercial setting, daily mopping or auto scrubbing the floor is important simply based on the amount of pedestrian traffic the floor receives. Conversely, in residential environments, you may only need to mop on an as-need basis. It is important to always use a clean mop and one that has not been previously soiled. The type of chemicals can have a dramatic impact on the preservation of your polished concrete floors. If the cleaner is too high in alkalinity or is too acidic, this can quickly start to degrade your polished concrete surface. So as we mentioned when we talked about the chemicals in our chemical industry, for most floor cleaning, what pH of cleaner do we use? You guys remember that? Anybody just Seven. unmute? Seven. Seven, yep, neutral pH, perfect. Thank you, Robert. So neutral pH cleaner. If it's too acidic, it's going to attack the floor, okay? If it's too alkaline, it could cause um, issues as well, but. Uh, the big worry is too acidic because we can literally start to etch the stone. Generally, a pH neutral cleaner is good, and there are some cleaner conditioners that actually not only help suspend the particulate, but also reintroduce trace amounts of silicate back into the floor during the cleaning process, which helps keep a hard wearing glossy surface. Check with your polished concrete professional for what they recommend the best maintenance practices are. In this case, the use of a conditioning cleaning agent in a walk-behind auto scrubber is used, which keeps these floors looking great for years to come. The type of pad or scrubbing bristles is crucial, especially when you consider some floors are being cleaned on a daily basis. Generally, red pads are a good all-purpose cleaning pad since white pads are finer and tend to hold the dirt in the pad. Any more aggressive of a pad than the red is simply too aggressive. Soft bristled brushes like you see here are also considered acceptable. As part of the preservation of polished floors, it is important to get any spills off the surface as quickly as possible. In this case, if the milk sits on the surface for more than 20 to 30 minutes, it'll slowly start to etch the concrete. That's the only real major problem of polished concrete 
is polished concrete can be stained through acids. He's going to talk a little bit about that. But if you guys have a chance, um, if you've got a sprout store in your area that happens to have polished concrete floors, go in and look in the milk and dairy section, as well as go down the aisle that has the vinegars or the pickles and notice the floor. You will notice on certain aisleways in grocery stores, for example, that have exposed concrete, inevitably stains are more noticeable in the aisleways that are acidic, such as pickles, salsa, and red wine. In this type of an environment, it is important to have a spill response kit and a cleanup plan in place in the event a spill occurs. Even in a residential setting, the same basic rules apply. Some manufacturers have recommended daily cleaning examples such as the frequency and the type of pads and cleaners to use, like seen here. Also, an important consideration is the type of system your polished concrete contractor put down. Maintenance pads are not a one-size-fits-all. For example, if a guard system has been applied, 3,000 grit diamond impregnated pads are too aggressive and over time will degrade the surface. In this case, a system like you see here would be used, which is a super cleaning pad, which is roughly a 6,000 grit diamond impregnated pad, followed by a super shine pad, which is roughly 10,000 grit. Conversely, if there are no topical treatments that have been previously applied, the use of what is referred to as a DOI pad, distinctness of image, can be used to preserve the gloss and the clarity since there's no film buildup on the surface. It is imperative to check with your polished concrete contractor for their recommended procedures using diamond impregnated pads like seen here. Be very careful on the type of brushes and pads used. Examples like shown here can quickly degloss any polished surface and reopen the pores of the concrete, making the floors very vulnerable. I love this picture. I saw it before uh, in one of the other classes when I was showing this video. This is an example of somebody not changing their floor pad. By the way, this piece right here is called the retainer ring. Do you guys see how the pad has literally been just degraded down to the point it's into the pad driver and it is just totally dissolved? That is somebody not checking their pads and replacing them regularly. This is a perfect example of what never to do with any floor pad because you will destroy a floor to contamination, almost like a sponge would absorb. When basic maintenance procedures are followed and the appropriate products are used, you can have a polished surface that will last a lifetime and one to be proud of. All right, a couple of things I want to on this video is first of all, apologize here on it. Stop that one. In that particular video, you guys notice that they also were showing a propane buffer quite a few times. A lot of times with a polished concrete floor, depending on whether or not they put a protective coating on it, would determine whether or not they would use a propane buffer for polishing the floor on a regular basis. Um, a lot of companies don't put those protective coatings on. As I mentioned, Costco used to do that. And when they did, they used to have to have a guy go around with a propane power machine to buff the floors every night. So can you imagine a store the size of Costco, how long it would take to buff that floor every night? You'd have one guy who just cleaned the floors and they, they had three steps. They had a gentleman who was going through dust mopping and using a right on sweeper. Okay. So a sweeper was uh, just sweeping up and vacuuming the dry debris. Then they had another guy with a walk behind or right on auto scrubber. And lastly, the third step is somebody would be running a propane buffer, usually either the first guy who swept it or a third person. So you can imagine all the work that they were putting into this floor. They changed over to using a system of that DOI pad, which is that definition of image. It's basically a 
super high grit, usually about a uh, 5,000 grit diamond that they're maintaining the floor with nightly. And it's constantly polishing every night. So now all they do is sweep it and then they run the scrubber over. There's no buffing of the floor. It saved about 30% of their labor cost by doing that. And their material cost, because they were no longer applying a coating, went down significantly. So uh, just some important things. The other thing to point out, what was the, the two most critical things you guys saw on maintenance of this floor? The very first thing he mentioned. Mark. Uh, that'd be dust mopping. Dust mopping. He also mentioned another thing right along with that. Mopping, wet mopping. Okay, and somebody else had a comment. Auto scrubbing. Auto scrubbing, yeah, thank you, Tasha. But the, the thing he also pointed out right at the very beginning is a use of a good entrance mat system. Remember, no matter what the floor surface is, whether it is a stone floor, a wood floor, a resilient floor, a carpeted floor, 90% of the soil, no matter what the floor is, comes in from the outside. We can capture up to 80% with a good matting program. So, huge feature. Robert, your question. Hey, um, how do they get the designs in the floors? Good question. I love that. So in the polishing process that we showed where the guy was grinding and polishing, after the initial cut, a lot of times what will happen is somebody will have created that design. Now, uh, in the case where you saw the big star design, that is what's called saw cuts. So they will lay out a design on the floor. They will draw that into the floor, okay? So they'll trace it on the floor. And then uh, one of the gentlemen on the crew will take a diamond blade on a saw, like a skill saw with a vacuum, and cut that into the floor. And they'll it'll be about, I think it's a, about anywhere from an eighth to a quarter of an inch deep that they'll cut it, they'll vacuum that out. And then that creates the pattern and then the coloring comes from a process of doing one of two ways. If it's a polished concrete floor, they'll use an acetone dye. And that will literally dye the concrete that color. And that's where these days you go into some of the higher end supermarkets. You'll see them with a colored concrete floor. That occurs for a polished concrete floor from a dyeing process, okay? If though it has a coating, okay? If they wanted to go the route, they didn't want to polish it, there's another route that they could go to create a decorative concrete floor. And that is instead of putting a polish to it where they're grinding it with diamonds, they'll clean the floor real good. They may do it one cut um, just to open it up a little bit but a lot of times they don't even need to do that. They will spray on an acid dye, okay? Acetone is a solvent. All it does is carry the pigment down to the into the Portland cement and change the color. Acid dye introduces a process, and as you can imagine, acid etches the floor. As it etches the floor, it changes the color. It, it stains it. And remember those stains from the pickle juice and from the milk and those things? That is an acid stain because those products are acidic. So to get color, minerals, okay, will react to acids. So imagine if you take a piece of iron or flakes of iron and put it in an acid solution, what color will that solution turn? Any Anybody have a, a guess? It'll look like rust. 
Yeah, brown. Brown, yeah, yeah. like an orangish color. Because iron with acid turns to rust. Okay. Now turn around and think of if you wanted a green color with an acid stain. What metal turns green when it gets uh, the acid to it? Copper. Copper, absolutely. Have you ever seen a copper sink or things that have been affected by it? It turns green. So there's about eight core colors from different metals that they will introduce. And so the chemical manufacturer will put metal into an acid bath and create a stain. When it is applied, it's clear. But when it hits the concrete, it turns that color because it has that mineral in it, that copper or iron or whatever. And so that's what will stain it. The thing with a stained concrete floor is that stain is not nearly as deep as it is with an acetone solvent stain. So as a result, it's very much on the top. And so if we grind it, we remove the stain right off the floor. So acid stained floors usually have a protective coating over the top, like a urethane coating of some sort, much like a gymnasium floor. So those floors do require a little bit more maintenance. More and more stores have gone away from acid staining and have gone more to the acetone uh, solution dyed concrete to create the, the colored effects. And there's amazing looks that you can do with that. Again, whole world of decorative concrete. Uh, I work with a school district down in Tracy, or no, south of Tracy, that they actually did red color uh, polished concrete for classrooms because that was their district's colors was this red. And it is absolutely beautiful what we were able to accomplish with that. And what we did was go in and remove all the existing flooring, the, com the crew, we trained them how to grind and polish the floor. And then they turned around and did the, uh, the dye and then finished polishing it up. And they densified it to hold that color in to make it really hard. Uh, in their case, they put a protective guard that protects the floor, but guards don't need much more than just cleaning and a little bit of buffing on the floor periodically. They don't need to be stripped and waxed. So it's a lot of interesting ideas on that, isn't it? Uh, polished concrete, really cool world uh, in dealing with that. So any questions before I move on to the wood floors? Nelson. All right, you were saying, uh, you, you have mentioned that um, the school district go um, move away from the towels for the classroom or carpet. But with some classroom, they have plywood with carpet on it. So how would it be able to convert that into? Uh, they can't. Kind of they can't convert it into a polished floor. What they can do is replace the old glued down carpet with what's called carpet squares. So Nelson, I will specifically address carpet squares in the lesson we cover when we come back from uh, the break on carpet. So good question though. Alex, your question. Uh, yes, just to be clear, this was all informative and this will not be tested on, right? That is correct. Yep. All right. Thank the you. only time you'll ever get tested on this is if you come to my polished concrete class. Then I will test you on it. Uh, Robert. What's the, um, the floor at the airport? What is that? Good question. So the airport uses a type of terrazzo. Okay. But instead of it being the old way terrazzo was made, and if you go into some really older buildings, like uh, some of the state buildings, terrazzo was a combination of cement and marble chips. 
about 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, they started to change the way to make terrazzo. And now it's an epoxy. So it's a thick epoxy material with marble chips, or you could do all kinds of different things. The value of that is the epoxy itself is a lot cheaper. It's easier to do as far as the process of putting it down. But then when it's done, they grind it smooth to get a nice uh, gloss to it. And they don't put a coating on that floor. The, if you put a coating, a lot of times the coating will turn yellow. Uh, the epoxies don't like coatings on it. So well, what I understand is that um, in the past, that floor was um, waxed. It was. I actually worked for the company that created the specialty wax for that floor. Yeah. And, and recently they have been taking it off. Yes. And it's like you can actually see the pits, you know, in the floor because yep. the wax isn't, isn't being taken off. Right. And it's also the process of how they're removing it. Right. If they would remove it the proper way, it wouldn't create that. And that's why it's likely that the airport's going to change who their vendor is. Right. Right. I know the floor was a big, big deal. Yeah. Yeah. They did a terrible job of maintaining that floor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, 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 it will polish out though. Right. I mean, it it's going to come out. Yep. And that's likely if, um, if the vendor is a vendor that I do work with, then I will end up going in and doing some consulting on that project. I'm hoping. Yeah. Kind yeah. of one of those things. I well, hope that yeah, happens. Good luck. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Good questions. All right. Thanks. All right. So now we're going to switch gears. We've talked about a very hard floor in the form of um, stone floors. And the concept of polished concrete, a lot of those same principles are applied into marble. So marble, just like polished concrete, a lot of times you will not put a coating on it. Granite won't even accept a coating. It is just ground smooth. Granite is a very hard, hard stone. It's one of the hardest stones there is. So as a result, granite is purely grinding and polishing, and that's it. We allow the stone to breathe. Alex. Is granite like a natural like rock? Or it is, is. It just a bunch of... No. Okay. Granite is a natural rock. The reason why we have that different variations in granite where it looks like it's uh, almost a salt and pepper look is because within the stone itself, it has that characteristic. Whereas marble, instead of having that characteristic, marble has what we call veining, where it's got this really beautiful design of a, a vein that runs through the marble. So, Different types of stone floors give us different looks. Marble's much softer than granite, but it's amazing some of the looks you can get with it. Tony. So, for example, I mean, how does a, how does a manufacturer like uh, Granite Expo, Granite Depot keep their costs down for granite slabs? So, two things. One is manufacturers who make those slabs, they will... Um, they will cut the slab and they will polish it in, in a major manufacturing plant where they have a machine that does it, which keeps the cost down. The other way that cost is controlled is the thickness of the slab. The thicker the slab, the more expensive it is. Now, as you can imagine, the thicker the slab, also the more durable it's going to be. And so typically a much thicker slab is used on a countertop. Most of the time when it comes to granite or marble on floors, they're made into tiles. And so that's done in a larger manufacturing plant. And they're usually about, I think, half an inch thick, five eighths thick on the tiles themselves. Yeah, super fragile. I had helped a buddy put something on his counter and then that... We had a, um, a little back, uh, little trim piece, and that thing just snapped right in half, and we just touched it the wrong way. Yeah. But uh, I was just curious how they, maybe they cut it with something different, half stone, half something else. 
No, you can't cut marble or granite okay. with anything. So right. literally it is a, it's just the quality of the stone itself. Mm -hmm. And the, they keep that cost down by, you know, the, the process. And to that extent, um, a, a granite or marble stone slab or something along those lines, the more polishing that was done to it, the more work that was done to it, the higher the cost. So, a, a, for example, a granite slab that is really highly polished, has a lot of gloss to it, is going to be much more expensive. Also, the characteristic, if it's a slab that has a lot of character, it probably came from an area where um, it's more costly to cut that slab. And think about it. What is one of the largest granite slabs in California that I can think of, and, and it may be even in the United States? Huge piece of granite. Anybody ever heard of El Capitan in Yosemite National Park? Huge giant, giant granite monolith. Okay. And those are slabs that they don't allow them to cut that stone off of that uh, feature. But granite is, um, there. it's a limited resource. You know, marble a lot of times comes from other parts of the world, so. All good questions. Okay, so let's change gears into talking about wood floors. And um, I'll share this video with you as well. Let me get this one loaded up. This comes from some friends of mine at the Boost Cottle Scrubber at a company called Surtech. Uh, I used to work for them. So the gentleman who is featured in the, this video is also my mentor in the industry. He's uh, been a big coach to me for the last 10 years. And he's been in the cleaning industry probably close to 50 years now. Worked in manufacturing, worked for uh, service companies. Interestingly enough about Dave here, who we're going to see, Dave currently uh, consults still for Surtech doing a lot of uh, work. Anybody ever shopped at Winco stores? Okay. Yeah. So Winco is cleaned by a company called Matworks, uh, based out of the East Coast. They're the janitorial service that does the work. And um, the, the process, they use a terrazzo floor, much like the airport has. So, Robert, what they do is they use a process of using diamonds to maintain that floor as well as they put a, a protective coating that is called a guard on that floor. So that is the floor um, at Winco stores. Theirs is a um, also an epoxy resin terrazzo, but it was done in a way that was easy to make, put a polish on it. So. Okay, let me get this loaded for us. Uses a pad that is rectangular, not round. It provides consistent contact across the cleaning path. The cleaning solution is introduced in the front of the rectangular scrubbing pad. Notice that the orbital action contains the cleaning solution in the pad and carries it for the full length of the pad, resulting in 50 to 70% less water being applied to the floor and immediately recovered by the vacuuming system, leaving the floor virtually dry. Though the floor may have appeared relatively clean before, Take note of the dramatic difference between the floor and the path Dave has created using Surtex L of 150 heavy duty cleaner and the boost machine combined. In a matter of a few minutes, Dave will have completed the first step of Surtex prep and recode program. 
as compared to the conventional methods of a single disk machine that would have taken twice as long to complete. Certex LF150 Heavy Duty Cleaner is the ideal product for preparing a wood floor for refinishing. Step 2. Scrub with Maroon Surface Preparation Pad. What we've done now is uh, this floor had a lot of chatter marks on it caused by the drum sander when they sanded it. So consequently, the chatter marks become low spots and uh, they get filled with body oil and, and dirt. When we screen the floor, the screen is so stiff and also so thin that it, it abrades the surface, but it doesn't get the dirt and body oil out of the low spots. And we really don't want to coat over that because it just becomes a, a permanent scar. So what we're doing now is we're doing a double scrub using maroon pads, the surface preparation pads, allowing the LF-150 enough time to do its work to emulsify the body oils and dirt. And on the second pass, we're picking it up, and you can see the results that the floor is much cleaner, brighter, and a lot more uniform looking now, and uh, properly prepared for laying a finish. The final step will be to... I want to point out something. When they're doing a, a preparation to restore the gloss on a gymnasium floor, what will happen is it will look unevenly dull, okay? Because imagine we're sanding, in a way, the top surface because a gymnasium floor, unlike a wax floor, is made with a very hard polymer called urethane. Okay, it's a very thick coating, and as a result, that that uh, urethane coating won't stick. If I just put it down on a, a an existing one, it'll peel off over a very quick time, usually within a matter of weeks. So it has to be prepped so that the floor will accept it. It literally is being sanded rough and all the dust removed and oils so that it will allow the new coating to go on to it. Back rag the floor with uh, plain cold water and clean white towels. And the purpose for that is to make sure any dust that fell out of the air is off the floor. And it also becomes a, a final rinse uh, to get any residue or, or anything we may have left behind with the auto scrubber. Step three, tack rag the floor. The third step in our gym floor prep and recoat program is to tack rag the floor by using clean white bath towels. We soak these towels in clean cold water and then wring them out tight and place them underneath a 36 inch push broom. Then we merely walk back and forth the length of the, of the floor with the grain of the wood. The purpose of this is to pick up any dust that has dropped out of the air and also to pick up any residue or water left behind by the auto scrubber. Step four, the Surtec Automatic Gym Floor Finish Applicator. So this is what we call T-barring the floor. This tool is different from what we'd use for normally laying floor finish. It is got a applicator, almost looks like a paint roller Okay. and they're applying the coating, you'll notice it leaves what we call a wet edge where they're almost squeegeeing off the excess and leaving a bead or stream behind on this outer edge that they'll pick up as they go each pass over the floor. As Dave begins to lay down the gym finish using the Surtec T-Bar applicator, notice he has total control at his fingertips. Because of this control, Dave is able to maintain a wet edge, eliminating any possible lap marks caused 
by the edge drying too fast. Dave is using Surtex Court Coat, a waterborne urethane wood floor gym finish. Surtex Court Coat utilizes the newest waterborne polymer technology to deliver a wood floor finish that is tough and durable, yet delivers the gloss, wear, and ease of use of conventional solvent-based oil modified urethanes. Court Coat uses a catalyzed blend of urethane and acrylic lattices for the ultimate in abrasion resistance, shine, and slip resistance. Now that you've been introduced to Surtex Comprehensive... So, let me walk through a little bit of the steps of this. The, the first step in the process itself was abrading the floor. So, actually cleaning it first. So, you know, obviously removing the dry soils just like anything else. Uh, cleaning the floor with an auto scrubber. Then they would abrade the floor with a surface preparation pad, that SPP, which is a maroon color pad. What that does is creates little scratches and it roughs up the floor enough so that it now is going to accept a new coating. After that's done, they have to remove any excess. No dust can be on the floor no excess water. You want that floor squeaky clean. You want to be able to run your hand over the surface of it and then be able to feel that it's just totally dry. Then they're applying this urethane coating. And there's a lot of different applicator systems out there, but the whole idea that T-Bar is they're applying it much thicker than floor finish. Generally speaking, most gym floor finishes are only two coats. That's it. You don't have put anything more on it. And those two coats will usually last anywhere from one to two years, depending on the maintenance of the floor and how much use is put on it. So as you can imagine, it's really important to uh, keep it well maintained. Nelson, your question. When you do a gym, a gym floor for a school, would it be best to turn off the AC so that when you do apply the finish, um, the finished coat, so it won't dry quick? Or Correct. if you have the IC on, the AC on, dry quicker before you finish it, so would it be best to turn it off? It, it, there's also another reason. Uh, first of all, gymnasium floors, urethane floors are they need more time to cure. So that's part of the reason. But the other thing is you don't want any, any dust circulating in the air. And unless you've done high dusting and removed all the dust off the top of the vents uh, in the building and dusted everything, that AC system is going to circulate the air and it's going to put dust into the air. So it's a great idea to turn the air conditioning system off when you're doing gym floor coating especially when you're going to coat the floor. So, you know, from the point of tack ragging, you want to keep that floor, the air, where it's not circulating and creating a lot of dust. And because it's a wide open space versus a smaller confined area, we don't need to introduce airflow or blowers. We really want it to cure naturally Keeping in mind that wood in itself, okay, is very porous. The other thing about wood floors is because they're natural, they have the tendency to expand and contract. So the reason why we use a urethane finish is that urethanes will expand and contract with the wood. Okay, so that's a big reason why we put those coatings on the floor. Imagine if we didn't put a coating onto a wood floor, how quickly it would get soiled, how any spills would cause it to warp. The urethane protects it from that, from the warping that would be occurring. Um, so there's a real reason why we use that type of coating on the floor. And at the same time, um, it protects it. So now what's happening and the reason I wanted you guys to see this process is to understand it from a maintenance standpoint. 
that when we're dealing with a urethane coating on a floor, we're now maintaining that urethane coating, not necessarily the wood itself. But at a certain point within a matter of two to three years, that floor is going to wear just like on the acrylic finishes on a soft floor. What will happen is dirt will get ground into the floor. So go back to your maintenance process. What's the thing that can prevent soil on this floor? Dust mopping. Dust mopping. And what else? Mats. 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 Yep. On a gymnasium floor, there's anywhere from four or more entrances to it because almost all gym floors will have entrances at all the corners. And then if it's like in a high school or um, college application, you may also have doors on one end of it that are into a lobby area. So all those areas should have entrance mats to capture as much soil. And if it's got a lobby, there should also be entrance mats outside the doors and inside to capture as much soil as we can because sand is the number one enemy of floors. So that soil, we want to get as much dry soil off as possible. It's so funny how particular people are about their gym floors. Um, for years, I would see them tell you that you couldn't use street shoes when you walked on the gym floor. They were very picky about their gym floors. Um, you still find college campuses that are very picky, that the only way you can get on that gym floor is by going in, changing your shoes, and, you know, because they were looking to protect it. They want that gloss for the image. So, and the other issue is if you think about a gymnasium floor, we're playing basketball on it, right? If they're playing basketball, you don't want the floor slippery. Oils that are tracked in on a floor can cause a safety issue. So from a standpoint of that, they make sure they keep it clean. Yeah. So just like on any other hard floor, entrance mats, dust mopping, and then cleaning it with either an auto scrubber or mop, using a neutral floor cleaner is a safe practice for maintaining this floor. Now you imagine an average gymnasium floor is about five to 7,000 square feet in size. Can you imagine how long it would take and how many mop buckets it's gonna take the rule of thumb as a thousand square foot, we change our mop bucket. That would be a rough job having to mop that floor. So that's why we use an auto scrubber. We can auto scrub that floor very quickly um, and do it efficiently. And generally speaking, remember our floor pads will last 30 to 50,000 square feet depending on maintenance. So same thing. Also to be aware of red pads is still the common pad to use for daily floor cleaning on a gymnasium floor. Okay. So important why reasons why we discuss those things. Any questions on the gym floor, what you guys saw that? Again, it's a quick, just informative, but any thoughts or questions? Seems fair, fairly simple. Not as labor intensive to restore it. However, the process of installing a wood floor, okay, when a brand new wood floor is installed, it has to be sanded after they put in all the pieces in a wood floor is tongue and groove. So each piece fits into each other. Then it has to be drum sanded smooth to get that floor nice and smooth. All that dust has to be removed. And then it has to have a primer put on so it'll accept a coating. And then they would put on a couple coats of urethane seal. So, Again, labor intensive, but probably not as labor intensive as a polished concrete floor. Interesting thing about a gymnasium floor, 
a good gym floor properly installed, properly maintained, can last up to about 50 years. Okay? A, again, if it's properly done, properly maintained, no damage to it. A concrete floor is forever. As long as the slab's there, it's there. So it never has to be replaced. So there's a real reason why more and more places are going to those. Here's another interesting fact. What we're seeing is a gymnasium floor that is wood. You are now seeing in school districts, their multi-purpose rooms with gym floors where they're doing basketball courts and so forth are being done with polished concrete instead of wood. Because again, it's a forever floor. Just maintain it. So a lot of value to it. And it's not as, um, it's far more forgiving than a wood gymnasium floor. Um, and the cost is about the same for installation. So, okay. So a gym floor prep and repo program. let me close that out. We are going to now move into the process of, I told you I was going to introduce our teams. By the way, I found my note that I had for who our teams were. So our basic teams was in cleaning a medical building. It's going to be Mark, Tony, and Robert. The three of you guys will be working together. In the public building, we're going to have Nelson, Alex, Alex, Eduardo and Tasha. And then for our school building, Nelson, you saw I didn't give you a uh, school building, is going to be Ken, Tyler, Christina, and then Archina, who is not here today. So what we're going to do for the next about 30 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, we're going to create the breakout rooms. You guys will give it a chance to visit and get to know each other a little bit. You guys are going to start to think about today, and this is the first discussion, what a medical building would look like. What kind of surfaces would be in that building? And we've talked about over the last couple of weeks, the surfaces that would be in an office in the, above the floor. We've talked about the hard floor surfaces, and there's a variety. It could be tile. It could be concrete. It could be carpet, uh, even though we haven't gotten into the carpet cleaning section. So I want you to start to put together an idea. And um, within your group, choose somebody who will serve as um, your team leader, okay? Somebody will that's going to help you with keeping the notes, putting this together, but understand this concept of you guys putting together a plan for maintaining this building is a team effort. Everybody should have a role in doing this. How you guys organize that, I will leave it up to you. But you're going to create an idea of how we're going to maintain this building. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create the groups. I'm going to move you into a breakout room. So what will happen is, as we do this, you're gonna, it's going to ask you the question, do you want to join this breakout room? The answer would be yes. Okay, so bear with me as I create these breakout rooms, and then I'll assign you guys. Okay, and So the first one we're going to get Roberts. Okay, you guys should start getting your invitations. I oh 
What's up, everybody? Hello. All right. So I'm going to join your guys' group for a few minutes, help you guys get a little bit organized. One of the first things you guys want to do is uh, choose somebody who will help to be a team leader for you guys that will um, help you just to make sure you get everything organized. Your building for you guys is a school. Now, the advantage you guys have here is Christina works currently in a school, and Ken, you've been a, a bus driver for a school. So between the three of you, I think you guys kind of know what a school looks like and how it's set up. What I'd like you to do is start to think about the rooms, kind of what the core rooms that you would have in that building and what those surfaces would look like in the rooms, okay? So take a few minutes to do that, and um, I will then join another group, but I'll come back and check on you guys in a few minutes. All right. All right. If you have a question, um, feel free to help me. If you guys need to I share any information, uh, let me know, but you can text me in the chat section. So just click on chat on the bottom, Text me and say, hey, uh, you know, Dave, I've got a question for you. And I'll come over and join you. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. I appoint Christina as the main boss of this here uh, group. Oh, you must know me very well then. <laughs> I, do, I just see that you have... You know, you have the moxie and, and the charisma to be, you know what I mean, doing things like that. Me, I'm just really, uh, you know, I kind of sit back and I do my work, you know what I mean? But you, you know what I mean? You're more forward, you know, and stuff like that. Okay. Um. Yeah, I don't have a problem doing that. I just, I'm not computer savvy and um, I'm not like note savvy or anything like that. Okay. So, um. I'll try to, um, because my handwriting is kind of yucky, but I'll try to take down as much as we write down. I mean, we think about, and uh, I'll try to put it on a, a Word document or whatnot, and then uh, restructure it as we get to the end of our project. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, Tyler, how do you feel about anything? Um, I... I feel good about this. Hey, hey Tyler, do you want to be the secondary uh, note taker? Uh, because I might miss something and you might get something and then we can collaborate so we can make that final document for our project. Maybe you can uh, be my secondary note taker. All right, I could do that. So yeah, basically, uh, schools have a multi-purpose room. So most of the old ones, they have the wood floors. So I'm gonna write down MP room wood floor right now. Um, well, for Elk Grove School District, because since I work in the maintenance department, they mainly have the um, the VCT tiles. Um, we don't have any that I'm aware of that have wood floors. Um, are we just naming off things that um ha that they have in flooring or um just in general an MP? Oh, okay. Um, and let me put. Let's talk about the MP room then, because yeah, that's interesting. Because um, the three schools that I actually went to, they had wood. So what what is this uh, called again? What kind of floor is that? Um, VCT tiles. Okay, so VCT tiles. Okay. Yeah. And, and what 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 basically uh, kind of uh, what kind of product product is that? Is it like like a vinyl or something like that? Um, 
I'm trying to think. Um, I'm not good with explaining stuff. I'm like a hands-on person. Um, um, it's like little, like, it's not like um, sheet vinyl, but it's something similar, but it's in, um, trying to think of like a store that would have it, like, um, like a Rayleigh's or a Bel Air, that style, um, you know, the little tiles on the floor that look plastic. Um, old school Kmart's used to have them, Sears, um, um, yeah. So they, um, they look like, like the old asbestos ones, but they're made out of vinyl and whatever other, uh, uh, product yeah. too, right? Yeah. I don't really know what they're made out of. Yeah. I just know I replace them sometimes. Um, they're just little squares. Um, but they're like white and they're like, uh, just, uh um yeah i know that for sure and i know some of the bathrooms do have polished concrete um which basically means that the like like dave was explaining everything was removed and grinded and sealed and polished um and those are super easy and amazing to maintain um i know a lot of the newer schools have what's called mondo floors the rubbering floors and their mps are going that way because it's um it it, it lasts longer um and that's a rubber made floor um yeah i don't i can't think off the top of my head what other what other um type floorings but I know for sure the polished concrete and we do actually in this district have one one um, school that has an entire MP with the polished concrete Prairie Elementary. Um, but all the newer schools have, like I said, the rubber schools, the, the, the sorry, the rubber floors. Um, and those we don't do anything to the manufacturer has to come out and repair or do whatever. Okay. Um... I, I wrote that down too, but I think uh, for the product, yeah, this, this project's uh, sake, we'll we'll probably use the VCT tiles. Okay. Because you know the rubber, hey, that's nothing. I don't think uh, David wants to hear. Well, we ain't gonna do anything because they're gonna come in. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, I mean, we can restore them. We can, you know, do a little yeah. thing, but we can't strip. I mean, we can't strip and wax those for sure. Those are nothing yeah. we. Okay, so yeah, the VCT, we can strip and wax those. We can also do a top scrub and a recoat. There's a lot of different things you can do. You can also high speed them just to make them pop if you don't have time throughout the year. Um, I do know that. Um, yeah. How about the walls? Um, the, the walls? Um, I used to have, a, um, what is it, plastic? um you know what i mean they have those sheets of plastic frp yeah yeah something um, like that you know they look like the floors but they're like harder plastic on it yeah we usually yeah. have those only in the bathrooms um i don't really know what it's called it's like that it's kind of like material i don't even know what it's called for the walls oh man um yeah i don't i i don't know what's on the walls. So maybe um, I, can, I, can, I can figure it out today because okay, this project right needs multiple days. I can figure it out today what they have on the walls. Um, All right. I, I don't know what it's called, but yeah, it's just, it's like, it gets dirty really fast. I do know that. Like, it's like, it feels like it's like, um, like light material. I wouldn't say like it's cork board, but it's something like similar to that to where it's just, it's not, I mean, it was just like a, a top cover, if you will, that just, they did it for looks, but for dirt, it's the worst. Yeah. Yeah. Dust collection and stuff like that on those kind of walls. Well, little, it's crazy. Little fingers, little fingers with food. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm going to put, I'm going to try You, I guess you're going to, you work at the school. So, when you go there, just make a note of what kind of walls you could see. And then when we come back on Friday, we can uh, um, 
look at each other's notes and we can choose what we're going to use and then we can go uh, put that down and then after that after we do all this I guess what we're going to do is find out what kind of chemical is best to use on these surfaces what kind of processes we're going to do you know what I'm saying oh um so like to clean a surface um yeah well it just depends on where you're at so for Elk Grove School District all we have is Trisana that is a aqua aqua I can never say the word right aqueous ozone um um, product. So it's only good for 24 hours. So after 24 hours, it's then a sanitizer and you can mop with it. That's all we're allowed to use with Elk Grove. So, um, unless we're deep cleaning, there's, um, maybe like a degreaser of some sort, but all of our degreasers are, um, chemical free now. Um, I mean, I do know a lot about that kind of stuff that the, the, so, we would be, we're talking about a day-to-day -day clean, correct? Yeah. Okay. So a day-to-day -day clean, it would be, um, spray it down with the, um, with the Trisana and wipe it with a rag of some sort or a doodle scrub. If it's like a big long wall, we usually do it, um, that way. Cause you know, okay. it's repetitive a big old wall that you have to wash a big pan mark down the line, you know, you don't want to be, you know, at a lower angle because most of it, it's the littler kids that touch it. And so it's just kind of harsh on your back. So you learn how to um, not use your body as much. Um, being a custodian, you, you learn the tools that you have to not destroy your body. So I would say um, with a microfiber, um, and maybe like a doodle scrub, um, you know, put the microfiber on the doodle scrub, spray the microfiber down and just go along the wall in the soiled area um, um, till it's clean. Okay, now what, what, what do you guys usually do? Man, this is like gonna be too simple, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, well, for me, so, yeah. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a lot of work, but you know, as far as this project's concerned, it looks like since I've been out of the school, my the school district I used to work uh, at, um, it has changed immensely because you know our uh, janitor he had like chemicals, yada yada yada. Now you're saying that you all just use the aqueous ozone and certain degreasers, so yeah. Um, what, what we need to do, I guess, is um, we can find out because we can use the polished floor, concrete floors in the offices as well. But Dave would probably want us to use and um, tell him what we require to clean a carpeted floor. So we'll, we'll probably be using carpet in the office area. So I'm going to write that down. But the bathrooms is cool because that's all I seen when I was going to school was concrete. Yeah. Is, that, is that a good idea? Is that good, Dave? Hey, I'm loving it. This is the cool part of this is you guys are designing your building. And, you know, you're thinking in terms of what you've seen before. I love it. I mean, it's a great idea. One of the things I will encourage you guys to do as you're doing this, and on Friday, we're going to spend a lot more time in our breakout rooms, digging a little bit deeper on it. I will encourage you to think in terms of green cleaning concepts. How do you maintain Yeah, that's what I was telling Ken. Awesome. Love it. Cool. If you guys have questions, that's what I'm here for. Yeah, yeah, I, I was amazed with what uh, how far it's changed because I used to work in the a San Juan school district mm -hmm. and the janitor had all sorts of chemicals. You know what I mean? <laughs> for cleaning. And now uh uh, Christina's saying, uh, okay, aqueous ozone and, and a few degreasers. I was like, gosh darn, that's that's kind of simple. It's hard work, but still, it, it's the chemical part is like easy now. You know what I mean? <laughs> it is a lot simpler. You know what's interesting that you mentioned that, Ken? Um, about, it's been about four or so years ago, I walked into a school and imagine going into a room that's probably about 200 square feet, shelves all around that room, and 
every wall, floor to ceiling was filled with chemicals. And they had, I kid you not, seven different disinfectants, four different neutral cleaners, um, two or three different bowl cleaners. It was crazy. And the supply company completely took advantage of this customer because they would go to the custodian of the school and say, okay, hey, time to order your supplies this month. Um, you need any of this? Yeah, 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 order me some of that. And he hadn't been trained on any details of this. And the salesperson would say, hey, we got this new cleaner. You want to try some of that? They had so much extra supply that had built up in that school that they were able to use that up. And I helped them reduce their chemicals down to, Christina, do you remember the H2 orange tube that you guys were Yes, I do. Okay. Yeah. So, I, I, I think that there's good and bad, but for me, for the boys' bathroom, the H2 orange is the best. I like, love it. Yes. I used to work for the company who made that product. But interestingly yeah. enough, I wasn't working for that manufacturer anymore. It was right after I started my own uh, consulting business. And I recommended, I says, hey, I know this works. I've worked for the company. Here's how it will benefit you. And we recommended that he goes to that. And then he was also looking into the aqueous ozone as kind of two products. But he spent almost a year before he could fully implement it in his schools, using up the supplies in that one school that they had been overstocked for so long that they were able to spread it across the other eight schools to finish up. So yeah, chemicals have come a long way. Good. I love the fact that you guys are kind of digging into that. And Tyler, for your sake, you know, as you're looking at this, realize that what you guys are doing is you're thinking in terms of how do I clean this area? How do I clean this building? So when you go to work for somebody, you're not just being able to here's a list, go do it. You're thinking in terms of how do I do it? How am I going to clean that area? So it, it's way beyond just following a, a task list. You're creating it yourself here. So. Yeah. And I will give advice to whoever wants, cause I have been a sub and now I'm on maintenance and I was a custodian for a while. Um, first couple of weeks, months, schools, et cetera, it is very overwhelming because you're just dropped into the field, kind of like not really guided through and you kind of got to figure it out. And every school is different. Every setup is different. Yep. Um, you know, so you, you just got to learn how to go um, site by site and kind of just do everything universal and just go, okay, yep. I do the garbage first, I do this first, et cetera. So you don't forget stuff. And then you can go back at the end of the night when you're checking doors and be like, oh, did I, you know, kind of like do a mental checklist. Um, that's what I used to do. But even then I'd forget like a pencil sharpener or a garbage can that was like under the teacher's desk behind her shoes. And I didn't know about it, you know, cause I was just a sub. Yep. And then I'd get a letter. Like, hey, you didn't get the garbage can. I'm like, well, I didn't know it was like behind your shoes, under your desk, you know, all the way in the corner. Um, it's just a good mental note. I mean, right. Well, I think you're on the right track. So you guys help each other. I love this. All right. You got it. Uh, just about five more minutes and then we'll all pull you out of the breakout rooms. All right. Okay. You got it. All right. So um, I guess we can decide um, uh, maybe Friday after you take your notes about the walls. <laughs> Uh, we can decide about what we're going to use for that. Um, we got the bathrooms. We got the bathroom floors. The yeah. office floor will be carpet, right? Okay, I got yeah, that. Yeah, we could we could do we could do carpet or we can do polished concrete. Some schools have fifty fifty, like the entryway is polished concrete or VCT, um, or even rubber floor, and then where the where the office ladies are that's usually carpet yeah um yeah there's varieties yeah 
But okay. we can do uh, we can do carpet. I mean, okay, right on. Um, uh, now the walls of the office. Uh, um, usually those are concrete. I, the schools that I've been to, they weren't covered. The only covered one was were, um, in the classrooms and the MP rooms. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Um, I'll check on all walls today. Um, okay. And I will just see what they're made of. Um, all right. I know, I know for sure. Um, like I said, it's, um, oh, I said it earlier. I forgot the name of it. It's FRP, I believe it is, um, for the bathrooms for sure. Um, they all have it. Okay. Um, but yeah, walls. It's, my weakness is his measurements and knowing exactly what um, certain things are. I mean, I know how to fix them. I know how to deal with them. But like to name them, I'm like, I don't know that wall or whatever, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure that um, we can look it up or, it, you know, like yeah. go on like a website or whatever. Um, and they'll they'll state what kind of like it. You know, we could find out what tiles are most used in certain situations, you know, yeah. as far as business and school. So maybe that'll that'll be more time consuming. But if maybe we could just get something for him to see that we yeah. now we're trying to do our, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I, th I, I think for the most part, I think it is like the tile floors, because I know like even in Kaiser, they have them. Um, the doctor's offices, they have them. It's that type. It's just ours aren't as shiny as the ones in Kaiser. Um, um, and they're just a different, you know, pattern. They're not so, like, smooth looking. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll figure it out um, today. Is there anything else I need to jot down or look for or notate or... Um, or anything um just um uh they usually get bulk of whatever so the whatever tile we're going to use yeah um we'll be using them for the classroom floors as well yes correct yeah oh, oh looks like he's about to kick us out of this breakout room all right so yeah i'll, I'll try to look up some stuff and uh and then we'll we'll uh all of us will look at our notes and compare, and then I can get that Word document, I guess, uh, the system of the document down, I guess, on the weekend. Okay. okay, sounds good. I will check up on those walls for sure. Tyler, do you have any comments before we go? Because you're kind of quiet. Um, I don't really have anything to say. Okay. All right. All right, I guess uh, we'll leave this room then. All right, see ya. We're back. You are back. First team First. back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <goodness>. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Pretty cool, huh? Being able to escape. Yeah, it's pretty slick. <laughs> yeah. It yeah. is. So one of the cool things that will happen as we do this a little bit more, on Friday, Friday's class is pretty much all breakout room. Um, I wanted you guys to get familiar, get to know each other a little bit. Friday, you'll do this. On Friday, you're going to dig deeper. We are going to incorporate you really making sure you have good concept of your building itself, right? Some, some ask questions about, can you do a, a floor plan? Guys, this is your presentation. So you're going to be able to do that. Now, here's a cool thing. I will open up screen sharing so that anybody within the team can share your screen. Um, and the way you'll do that is I'm going to open this right now so I can just show you guys. On your screen, at the bottom of your screen, where you see the mute and the video button and security, you'll also see a green share screen button that's got a little bit of an arrow. Okay. Does everybody see that? Oh, yeah. Okay. 
So within the groups, when you're in your breakout room, you'll be allowed to share your screen if you found a cool YouTube video that can help, maybe a picture of something, maybe even a picture of a building that says, here's an example of a medical building or a school or whatever. Uh, what I'm loving is I'm seeing this, you guys are really thinking in terms of your buildings. You know, uh, Christina was, she can bring a lot to helping with uh, understanding what a school is like. Um, you know, this is some examples. Each of you guys have, you've got enough experience in your groups to really help each other. I really almost wish I would have said in uh, group one that you guys were claiming to get an airport because of your guys' experience there. So I'm almost tempted to give you guys an airport instead of a medical building, but we're going to leave it to medical. I may tease you and say, hey, you guys got to do two buildings so you can do an airport for me. Dave, are you sure you want us to do this? Because in, in talking with my partners, we can almost just start a business. So fun thing about this, okay? I kid you not, that is the, you know, in, in this process of doing this, this is what a lot of building uh, service contractors have to do. They have to do this thing. So it opens up for you guys also the idea, if you went to work for a cleaning service, being able to help them in the aspect of project management. Okay. Robert, you mentioned that you could start a cleaning service. And I, one of the career paths that they ask us to do is to give you guys tools that if you ever wanted to start your own business, you had a little bit of those tools to do it. Our class doesn't allow enough time to really get into uh, starting a business and those things, but this is a foundation to that. Mm -hmm. um, the other cool portion of it, if you were working for a cleaning service and needed to figure out that, and I, I'm going to use the example. We were talking about an airport. Robert, who currently works out at SAC Airport, and Mark, you used to work out there for United, right? I think you're muted, but. That's correct. Yeah, okay. I'm out in uh, San Francisco now. Okay. So the janitorial service who's currently cleaning at Sacramento Airport, um, that contract is up for renewal. And the county is taking bids. They actually already closed that process, and they're analyzing bids from different contractors for that specific contract. The thing about it is, a project manager, their job would be to go in and identify how they're going to clean that building. I worked closely with the account manager who was putting together the proposal to help them to see, even though the bid required a lot of stuff and gave them a good idea of what was going to be done, we broke it down even further. Think about things in an airport, such as, I don't know, escalators, right? Um, one of the things that Robert would tell you is they also have to be able to have um, the ability to clean the windows, to clean the artwork, uh, large sculptures. If you've been to Sacramento Airport, you know it, at Terminal B and Southwest area, they have this gigantic rabbit that is going down a hole, right? Thinking of you know, the Alice in Wonderland idea. This rabbit sculpture is huge. How are you going to clean that? Oh my gosh, what a project that would be. So, you know, every time we are given these opportunities, it's an opportunity for us to think in terms of how do I do that? And that's what you guys in this class are doing. You're learning why we clean things and how do we do it and using your thinking ability to come up with a plan for how you're going to clean that building. So um, I'm excited for you guys. This is a fun project and it's also a team building project. So have fun with it. Friday will be a lot of this. 
So put some thought behind it as we get into it. And um, then we'll go from there. So that's it for today. No homework, more than just kind of reviewing stuff. Keep uh, Get your testing completed. On Friday, I will be checking on each of you guys to see where we're at on testing. So, okay? Cool. That's it for today. You guys have a good Wednesday. Stay dry. And I will see you all on Friday morning. All right, guys. Take care. All right. Actually, I got a question about the testing. Yes, sir. Uh, is there like a specific like due dates for these tests or um, like what so, would be like the. So the drop dead deadline is you have 60 days from the time we began to complete all your testing. OK, which wow. goes beyond the end of the class. Technically speaking, if you don't finish before the class is over, you can finish after 